Today in motorsport, we celebrate the one year anniversary of unsafe press release. Here's to another year of unbridled bullshit motorsport news. Bottas's fortune continues to squander, and it makes me ask myself if God is punishing me for this. The Spa 24 hours happened, but I can't say I watched it. Sorry, Sasha. And Alexander Rossi wins in mid-Ohio and solidifies himself as a real title threat. All in a jam-packed episode of Unsafe Anniversary Release. Your unreliable source for racing news. In the world of Formula One, the final race before the summer break came into the Hungara Ring in Hungary. Kind of redundant, that sentence, eh? The race started with the two Mercedes drifting away in first and second. You can guess who was where. And for the longest time, everyone thought that would be the end of it. But like the majority of the season, that was mostly not the case. Unfortunately, and in a case of F1 not changing in the slightest, it didn't favour Vettel, Bottas or Ricardo, as you'll see later. The race did start promisingly in other places, as once again, Max Verstappen had a loss of power and he was out of the race by lap 5. That's one consistent thing in Formula 1 I will never get tired of. Unfortunately, that was the only thing about the race that was not unbelievably rage inducing, because it became a slow and painful downhill slope as everyone's favourites started having bad things happening to them. Daniel Ricciardo had to start 12 thanks to Red Bull being shit at rain, and he was making his way up the field as you would expect him to do. While at the front, Vettel had a bad pit stop demoting him to third, and the Mercedes of Valtteri Bottas was once again having problems with tyres. It wouldn't be a 2018 F1 race if Bottas didn't have some sort of tyres problem. Vettel eventually managed to catch up to Bottas, and then Bottas locked up, Vettel thought he had the move done, and they made contact. Fuck. Typical, eh? And that ended a terrible weekend for Bottas. Except it didn't because despite still having tyres that might as well have been worn down as Aaron Hansen's beatboxing, he had to put up with Daniel Big Rick Energy Ricciardo, still on a charge. And guess what the fuck happened? They made contact. Of course they did. As if Bottas hadn't had enough bad luck and bad fortune, he gets a whole fucking load more. And thus ends a terrible, awful, rage-inducing weekend for Bottas. Except it didn't, because Toto Wolf had to open his big mouth by calling Bottas, quote, a sensational wingman, which, rightly so, hurt Bottas. Toto then tried to clarify this statement by insisting that Mercedes doesn't favour a driver. While I believe this is true, surely he could have found a better word than wingman. Like, best driver in the world, or one million times better than Lewis. Jokes aside, it's another blow as a Bottas fan. But at least we got to hear Christian Horner jinx himself on Sky F1's commentary like an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm, and Daniel Ricciardo once again giving into memes again by saying, quote, Big Dick Energy on Team Radio. Give it a few more races and he'll be T-posing on the podium. Yeah. We're back again in mid-Ohio, low Ohio, high Ohio, whatever recycled joke I can think of. Because IndyCar raced there. That's about it. Alexander Rossi once again gave everyone a big old piece of their mind as he took the Verizon P1 award for the third time this season, showing that even if Penske are going to reap all the spoils, at least we're still having Andretti Autosport to look forward to. Joseph Newgarden took the lead at some point too, making my previous statement completely redundant. But thanks to the lovely world of pit stop strategies, trademark, Robert Wickens, who was on a three-stop strategy at the time, was in the lead of the race come the halfway point. Robert Wickens then had his lead almost completely made useless thanks to fucking backfires in the late stages of the race. And the pit stop window gave Alexander Rossi a race lead again. By a huge margin. A lead in which he would keep to the very end as he would take his second win of the season. Putting him somewhat closer to championship leader Scott Dixon, who is looking to get his fifth IndyCar title. If he does, he'll be the first to win five titles since AJ Foyt, who won all of his titles during the USAC era. Shit's starting to get really good in IndyCar. Why is that surprising to me? And to top it off, during the cooldown lap, Rossi tried to do some donuts to celebrate his win. He ended up beating the car between the track and the grass. You're a genius, Alexander. to finish off this episode, I'm going to talk about F2's Hungry Race. Well, mostly the feature race, because I didn't really watch the sprint race, but I'll do a small summary of that. 
Usually, I refrain from talking about F2 races because I'm blocked by the official F2 Twitter. And about 70% of all the live tweets I get during F2 races are quote tweeting said Twitter. So that kind of devalued my F2 watching experience. But today's an exception because this weekend's races are a heck of a lot of fun. And also, I have some bones to pick with Sky F1 too. So the F2 races in the UK are exclusively within the rights of Sky Sports, who broadcast the races live. This weekend, however, they did some absolutely ridiculous universe brain thinking with this recent decision. Without notifying anyone, they made it so that you can only see the F2 races by pressing the red button on Sky Remotes. Without context, this doesn't seem too bad at all, but a big percentage of viewers are watching Sky via Sky Go or Now TV, which doesn't have a red button unless you're talking about the power button. F2 is already exclusive to paying subscribers to Sky F1, to make it even more exclusive by singling out a large percentage of viewers who pay for the subscription is an insult and a terrible marketing decision. And I hope it isn't something that persists within Sky F1. Okay, rant over. But at least the race was good. Sergio Sete Camera led the charge away at the start of the race with Nick De Vries giving him a run for his money too. Artem Markolov wasn't having as good as a race at the start as he made contact with Nairi Fukuzumi. But that was only the start of the crazy shit that would happen in this race. Gunther and Delatraz would literally fly higher than the Wright brothers as they made contact on lap 2, while your friendly neighbourhood meme, Nando Loris, was making moves in the wet like a mastermind, disposing of Antonio Fuoco, Jack Aitken, Luca Giotto and Nick De Vries, before eventually overtaking Sete Camera for the lead. And then he just ran away with it. It was looking like a Nando Loris breakthrough. And much needed too, considering he's behind George Russell in the championship battle. He ended up getting 10 seconds from second place in just a few laps. But Nick De Vries was suddenly catching up, and the giant lead that Norris had at the start of the race was whittled down to only a few tenths. And I shit you not, Nick De Vries takes the lead on lap 27. Unbefucking leaveable. But if that wasn't enough, Alexander Albon made a move on Jack Aitken went wide, and then nearly crashed into the barriers trying to make it back on the track. Pants shitting action here in Formula 2. And the icing on this giant wedding cake of a race, Sergio Sete Camera was trying to make moves on Lando Norris. And so was Antonio Fuoco. It just never stopped. Sete Camera made one more move on Norris, but made it too wide, giving third to Fuoco. Nick De Vries would win the race comfortably, and Sete Camera came for a lunge at Fuoco one more time, making contact with him and spinning them both out of contention. Lando Calrissian made a very close second, putting his title chances back into contention. And Alexander Albon won the sprint race too, so that's pretty cool. And you know what? It would only be fitting that we would have an incredible feature race on the first race not featuring Santino Ferrucci. Isn't this just amazing? And that's about all I have time for. I would talk about the Spa 24 hours, but I didn't watch it, which is a bit of a shame. I kind of let down a friend of mine. But I hope I've made it with this shitty episode of UPR. So, as always, follow me on Instagram at cookproductions1, follow me on Twitter, buy my music on Bandcamp, donate to me via coffee, do all that lovely stuff. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you whenever the fuck I make another one of these fucking shit shows.